the title of our thinking, Peace, when there is no peace. Now these words would have been uttered around or soon after 600 BC. Jeremiah was a prophet and a priest who preached mainly in Jerusalem for at least 57 years, perhaps longer, his preaching career or ministry. Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians 586 BC. And the complaint of Jeremiah is that the royal household and the princes and the elders of Judah in the city and the priests and the scribes were all reassuring the people that there would be no invasion, no trouble, no distress, no deaths. And so he quotes them virtually here, saying, peace, peace. Now the Hebrew word for peace could equally well be translated safety, safety, or rest, come to that. A variety of terms would be equally valid. Safety, peace, all is well. There is nothing to fear. There is nothing to be concerned about. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. How could they reassure the people? Well, because they did not want to reform. The city was guilty of great idolatry an abandonment of their proper worship and faith. And the royal house and the leaders of the people, they didn't want to reform, and they didn't want to pray, and they didn't want to rest upon God and trust in him. I won't stay with this, but their trouble was they would much prefer to trust their own feeble political solutions their trusting of another nation to come to their aid, a nation that was quite unable really to help them and unwilling. However, they wanted to trust in that, and so they somehow convinced themselves that they would be safe. There would be no invasion, and they shrugged off the obvious, and it was a powerful delusion that they suffered from because the invasion was certain, the Babylonians came, Jerusalem duly fell, there was great suffering, and Jeremiah, who had been ignored, all his warnings were proved right. Now this is the background to these words. Now today, the cry is the same. Safety, peace, you don't need God. That's the cry of society today. You don't need God, you don't need religion, you don't need anything for this so-called soul, if you believe in that, you don't need anything spiritual. It's the, and there is a kind of peace. Oh, well then, we don't have to worry about those things. And generally speaking, people don't. They're not, people don't walk about these days in fear concerning their souls, whether God will judge them for being indifferent to him, whether God will judge them for being actually against him and slandering him. People don't walk about with concern and fear about judgment, about God, about slighting him, about offending him, because this is so drilled into us today. Peace, peace, what are you worried about? What are you concerned about? That's a myth. There's nothing to it. But it's a powerful delusion. And that's what I want to speak about in the short time we have this evening. There's no God, there's no judgment, the peace of unreality. Now I know a man, and he's now very aged, but I knew him, oh, back in the 1950s. Here's a piece of ancient history for you. And it's somewhat older than me, but I knew him well, and at that time he had a very interesting job. He managed in London the London holdings or buildings of a man who owned his own bank, 
Now, that's a curious thing to say because you can't really own your own bank. However, it, it was his own private bank, a fabulously wealthy man, so everybody thought. And uh, uh, this friend of mine didn't know anything about his banking activities. He was only responsible for managing uh, properties in London for him. But he knew him quite well and he knew his wealthy lifestyle and his relaxed manner and so on. Well, he was astonished, like most other people, when it turned out that this most prosperous banker with his own private bank in London, much admired at the time, was head over heels in debt and so overextended, so much so, that a lot of his great borrowing depended on fraud and mythical figures and amounts and things like this. And he went down and of course he was prosecuted and he went to prison for a long time, this man, and it was astonishing to everyone. But this is the point I want to make. My friend was astonished because this man was absolutely at peace. It's as though he didn't see it coming himself. It's as though he believed his own dishonesty. He believed his own myth, his own sales pitches, how he put himself across. He believed in his own mythical wealth and he lived it. And he was spending, had his own aircraft, had all sorts of things and was spending money right up to the eve of his bankruptcy and his arrest. What a delusion. And I've heard, though it's not a world I know much about, I've heard that this is not uncommon with people who are head over heels in debt to carry right to the end. I did know another family who ran a small business. They weren't professing Christians. Well, quite a big business, I think it was. And they were bankrupted to their own astonishment. It wasn't that they didn't know where they were financially. It's just that they were so busy telling themselves, peace, peace, it'll be better around the corner, something will turn up, that they didn't, didn't sense it, didn't realize it. And that's us. Peace, peace. Don't think about God. Don't think about the Spirit. Don't think about eternity. Don't think about your accountability. Oh, well, I don't. I'm perfectly at ease. But it's a delusion, friends. Because one day we have to face him. The God who we've rejected. The God who we've spurned. Like somebody I knew, who was a very, very intelligent person, but he dreamed all the way up to his most crucial examinations at the end of his university course. And he was so confident and so at ease and he failed and he flunked it and he went down badly. And it was a great shock to him. I wonder if somebody here has done that, I hope not, for your sake. But it's possible to be completely deluded about how you're doing, how you're faring, what the reality is of your position. And that's how we are spiritually. Peace, peace, safety, success, all is well when it's far from the case. It doesn't happen so much nowadays, I don't think. I'm somewhat out of my depth with this, but you know, years ago, there was a different culture among the doctors. There were certain things, say 40 years ago, not so long ago, 50 years ago, that the doctors wouldn't tell you if they didn't think you should know. Years ago, they wouldn't necessarily tell you, for instance, if you had cancer. Oh, well, that's the doc, even good people, the doctor's prerogative. Not necessarily pass that sort of information on. And I've been told by the older doctors, oh, well, you don't realize that back in those days, many patients used to say, don't tell me if it's cancer. Now, I don't know what the situation today is, but the culture's changed and the medical profession is much more open with us. But you think of years ago how it could be that there would be people really without long to live. And they hadn't any idea. And the doctors wouldn't have told them because they perhaps thought it would shock them or hurt them or send them into a downward spiral. They probably meant well, but there was a delusion. But that's how we are spiritually. And, dear friends, I, I shouldn't tell you these stories, you know, but we had a dear couple in this church years ago, and uh, during the war, in World War II, they lived in Shoreditch, East London there, and uh, they were like 
quite a few other people who stopped going to the air raid shelters. And it was such a hassle, and they were so crowded. I'm speaking as though I was there. I'm not, of course. However, and so they decided to stay at home. And at first they were a little afraid, and then they got used to it. And they felt safe. And they felt, well, this is the sensible thing to do. And first of all, they would hide under the table. I don't know what good a table is to protect against a bomb, but anyway, they would get some cover, and then they grew bolder, and they would just stay in bed up on the first floor of their house, and so on, and they'd hear the crashing and the banging and the anti-aircraft and all the rest of it, and they'd go peacefully off to sleep. Until one night, there was a great big bang, and they woke up with a start, and there was dust everywhere, and the front of the house had gone. And there they were, just looking out into the street, a yard or two away, and no front wall, you see? And uh, it's quite funny, I was, my wife and I used to be very amused because when they told you this story, they would say, and uh, we, were, we were all right, as safe as houses. Well, it's not a very <laughs> good illustration. Anyway, uh, but after that, they went to the air raid shelter. But you see, and I'm not criticizing them, they were, they were grand people, but the delusions we can suffer from, feeling safe. Well, you, if you knew tomorrow your house is going to be hit. And we've all got to render an account to God. And we don't think and care and mind about spiritual things. I wonder if that's your situation here tonight. Well, what's the sedative that makes us go to sleep and think all is well when we're out of step with God? and we're far from him? Or what's the euphoric drug that we take which keeps us so cheerful when we're in a serious position and we're far from the living God and we've offended against him? Well, there's quite a number. You feel the blues, you feel down, you feel depressed sometimes, you feel a burden in life, perhaps you feel a certain purposelessness and uh, you get a disappointment serious disappointment or your conscience troubles you about something about many things perhaps and what do you do to keep feeling peace peace when actually there is no peace for you because you're far from God how do you do it well I'll tell you what people usually do they go in for all kinds of distractions to jolly life up. They resort to all kinds of entertainments. They may not be bad entertainments. They may not be sinful entertainments, but you crowd with your life with things to cheer you up. That's why people have to live with the iPod or equivalent on, because life goes down without it, because actually there's no peace. Actually, you've got no purpose. You're out of step with God. You're away from him. You've got to have something to keep you distracted, to keep your spirits up. That is, your human spirits. And other people, they engage in almost non-stop conversation. <laughs> the popularity of mobiles and the lines on the go all the time. It may be nothing else you're talking about. It may not be bad conversation. And conversation is good and wholesome I'm not criticizing it but you depend upon it you've got oh, off I'll call this one I'll call that one I'll call another one the distractions because life would be miserable wouldn't it if you didn't have all these distractions because you're saying really peace peace safety success happiness that isn't true because you're cut off from God and you've got no eternal destiny worked out and you don't walk with him, and you're under his judgment. And then there are people, well, and again, this isn't necessarily bad. Young people got a spirit of adventure, so they may get into something which is exciting, or even dangerous, to give them some thrill, some buzz. But really, it's a distraction. Then you need more of it, and more of it. Then another very popular distraction is atheism. Read the books of and listen to them. Go to the, the websites of people who attack God. They do it very dishonestly. 
They do it with dishonest arguments. But be convinced like that. Let atheism convince you there is no God. There's no spirit in you, no soul. You don't have to worry. Let atheists give you peace with all their lies and tricks and fictions. Another one, which is very popular, is crowd syndrome. Just say to yourself, well, there can't be a God, or there can't be a day of judgment, or there can't be a heaven and hell and an afterlife, or there can't be a spiritual aspect to life, because all these people over here don't think so. Line up with the crowd. It's amazing what people will do in a crowd. People will do quite dangerous things if other people are doing them that they'd never do by themselves. So just follow the crowd. That will give you some peace, some calm. Then uh, familiarity with a thing eases a burden. If you committed a great sin, and the first time you committed it, you felt dreadful, and your conscience roared, and you felt unclean. Then you committed it again, and it wasn't so bad. And then again, and then again, and now your conscience doesn't murmur. You've got used to it. You can do it. You can tell that lie. You can do, perform that unclean act. You can commit that sin. That's the way some people get peace. They just do the things that would concern them repeatedly until it doesn't hurt anymore. It doesn't speak. The conscience doesn't worry them anymore. We're constantly finding ways whereby we can be at ease. We can get peace living as worldlings, as total materialists, blaspheming God, ignoring him, breaking his laws, spitting upon him, and think we're successful, and we're at ease, and we're safe. Well, I won't go into all those negative things. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Look at this. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly. The illustration is of an injury. Perhaps it's a broken leg and a gash. Well, it hasn't been set. The bone hasn't been repositioned and no splint, no proper closure of the wound or cleansing of the wound. The proper work hasn't been done. There's just been a kind of light uh, covering put over it. They've healed the hurt, the bruise, the break or the fracture of the daughter of my people slightly or lightly is actually the Hebrew word in some superficial way. And they say, you're fine. You'll be all right. Well, you won't be all right. Possibly there'll be serious infection. Possibly gangrene will set in. And so it will with you. If I were to tell you tonight, don't worry about God. All is well. Everyone's nice. Nobody's out of step with the Lord. Well, what would happen is healing the wounds slightly. The gangrene of unbelief and cynicism would set in. And you'd be even further away from the Lord. My task is to urge you to think of the soul, to think of your relationship with God, to think of the day of account, to think of death and judgment. They may seem negative, but it's vital. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Isaiah puts it differently. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. And though it may jar us, we are the wicked if we're away from God. This isn't just human observation, this is God speaking in his word. The word of God looks past the human facade. Let's look at ourselves as a society. You can see all the irregularity in life, broken marriages. Why do marriages break up? Because so often, unfaithfulness, because of human sin, it's all there. Peace, peace, says atheism. When there is no peace, we're troubled beings. We're broken people. There is sin committed everywhere. Alcoholism. Oh, there's the world of business and rich people and great success and 
business empires. And yet, within there, there are people you might think had dignity and success, and they're dependent upon alcohol. And then everywhere there are people dependent upon other forms of drugs. And there are many, many people deeply depressed. Now, I have to be careful when I say this, because I, obviously, a good many people suffer from depression for chemical reasons, because they're not well, because there's something wrong. But equally, many, many people suffer from depression because their conscience is out of sorts, and their lives are all wrong, and they're sailing along, peace, peace, I'm successful, I'm happy through gritted teeth, I'm well, and they're not. Things are all wrong. There's no walk with God. There's no help from on high. Oh, unhappiness, unease, unfulfilled people, insecure people, and we're in great danger. There is no peace. We're under judgment, and we're storing up the wrath of Almighty God. That's the word of Jeremiah. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Why? No time for God. No concern about his law. No homage paid to him. No thanksgiving. No worship. No respect. No desire. No humility before God. And we pay for that. That's deeply sinful and offensive to Almighty God. And so we have no union with him, no interaction with him, no answered prayer, no strength from him, and no eternal hope, no place in heaven. Peace, peace, they say. Don't worry about God and about heaven and about eternity and about religion and about judgment. Don't worry. Be at peace. Be at rest. And you're in serious danger. And God will keep his word and bring us into judgment. And among the greatest people, some of the greatest academics in our land are deeply unhappy people, really, when the smiles fade. Some of the leading politicians behind all the flamboyance are desperately unhappy people. I can tell you that I know it. There are wealthy industrialists, are deeply unhappy people. There are professional people, many even in the helping uh, professions and in medicine and so on. And there are many are deeply unhappy people and many reliant upon all kinds of crutches and supports like alcohol and so on. And the reason is peace, peace without God. And there is no peace. And life is a pretense, and we cheer ourselves up with trinkets and trivialities and possessions and novelties and all kinds of things like that, and it isn't well with our souls. That's what this text is about, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And the moment of greatest discovery for any human being and the moment of greatest maturity is this. It's the moment of enlightenment. It's the moment when we come to realize the truth about ourselves and how bad we are and how much we need the forgiveness of God and the possibility of coming to him. Let me tell you another story. It is again ancient history. I go back to the 50s when I was a teenager. Now, I had two older sisters. They were older than me, and they have both passed away. But one of them, in the 1950s, with her husband, well, they owned uh, a big Spanish restaurant in Chelsea. And I'll tell you about this Spanish restaurant. It fascinated me. I visited there, and uh, they had I don't know whether you know the King's Road, Chelsea, uh, and you go past, uh, uh, you know, Peter Jones and down the King's Road and those big properties. Well, they had one of those big properties and three basements. The basements for three of them and one of them. And in these three basements, and they were very big basements, was this Spanish restaurant. And in the 50s, 
it was the talk of the town. It was the place to go. It was very expensive. And in fact, it was so thronged that in the end, there was, it had to be a club. You had to subscribe and have admission, and, as well as booking and everything. And they, it was much too noisy for me because they had real Spanish flamenco dancers down there, the only ones in London. So it was a very noisy place. Uh, and everything was candles in bottles and all the rest of it. Now, this is the point of this story. That I, w I visited once during the day and somebody had to go down to the restaurant, which wasn't open, it was uh, only opened in the late hours. And uh, there, um, they had to go to check that staff had done the right things and all this sort of thing. So all the lights were on. I'd never seen the lights on. You couldn't see they were there usually, all the strip lights. And the place looked to me to be so disreputable. It looked fantastic at night when only the candles were in the bottles. A place, a fascinating place. And all the tables looked so pretty and everything was laid out and the racket and the crowds. But when you saw it empty by day, under the light, why the walls were peeling, the ceiling looked disgusting. The, and this was an expensive place. Things weren't clean, and so on. And the, the, this is my illustration. This is the moment of enlightenment, when God graciously deals with us, and we see the kind of people we really are. When the candles are in the bottles, you don't see it all. When the lights go on, you suddenly realize what sort of a person you are. This is enlightenment by the Spirit of God. I never realized this much was the matter with me. I never realized what a self-concerned, self-interested, wayward, sinful creature I was in thought, word, and deed. And now I see it, and it horrifies me. There is the moment of horror when you come to become a Christian, when you seek and find the Lord. There's the moment, if you like, of revelation or enlightenment when you see your need and you see how much you need the forgiveness of God. This is me. It's like those people in Jerusalem all those years ago when the Babylonians arrived and the scores of thousands of soldiers and chariots were on the hillsides and the battering siege engines to bring down the walls when the whole array was there and they looked out upon it, then it dawned on them. Their danger and their delusion was shattered and they realized what was going to happen. And that's the kindest thing God can do to us is to shock us and show us ourselves and the truth about us and shatter our delusions and show us our need of his forgiving love so that he can, we come to him and we bow the knee and we ask for his forgiveness and he gives it to us to be shocked, to be miserable, made miserable, to see what I have done and what I have done to others and the record and that I cannot stand before the living God. Peace, peace, when there is no peace, but Christ brings peace. He's the Prince of Peace. We have peace by the blood of Christ. He suffered and died on Calvary's cross to bring us to peace and safety and union with himself. That's the message of the gospel. Oh, dear friends, I must come to conclusion because I've been speaking to you for a long time, but oh... Just think of what Christ paid to secure peace for us. His kindness and his love. We talk about peace by the blood of his cross. That's in Paul's letter to the Colossians. Peace by the blood of his cross. By the blood. By the blood. Why do we talk so much about the blood? the blood of Christ. After all, strictly, technically, truly, 
It wasn't the blood that paid the price for my sin. It was Christ in his holy soul bearing the invisible wrath of God, the eternal wrath of God that I deserve, that punishment forever. He had a punishment far greater than the lashings he received before being nailed to Calvary's cross or the pain of the nails through hands and feet or the hanging and dying in the heat of the sun. He suffered a pain many times worse than that when the wrath of God due to me for my sin and the sin of millions and millions of others was poured out upon him. The blood was almost the least of his sufferings, dare I say it. So why do we speak much about the blood? And we say peace, reconciliation with God by the blood of his cross. Well, it's by blood that we're helped to understand it. Do you mind if I tell you this? If you see a bad accident, and as you're very used to working with injured people, but if you see a bad accident, and the impact of somebody hit by a car, say, and there's an injury, and there's blood, well, for the vast majority of people, you're shocked. Something inside you reacts with shock. Blood. Blood was shed by Christ. Who was he? He was the incarnate God, entered into flesh out of unbelievable love to come and ransom guilty people and to suffer and die for us. Blood shocks us. Blood points to the sufferings. It was itself the result of suffering, but it points to even deeper sufferings. What a shocking thing that God, who should be worshipped and respected, came down and was hurt and punished. They even tied his hands. They bound him. They bound him and then hit him and hit him and hit him and lashed him and scourged him and nailed him to a cross. He was God, the God-man, the savior of the world. And he went through all that humiliation for us and he bore away our sin. And when we think of the blood, we think, my Savior, the Lord of glory, who made me, who really owns me, he went through that out of love for me. I haven't thought about him, but he thought about me. I haven't cared about him, but he cared for me. I have broken his laws, but he came for me to suffer in my place if I'm one of his, to die for me and to bear away my punishment in my place. Oh, friends, if only you could have enlightenment. Even if it makes you totter around and think, oh, what am I to do? I need God. I need forgiveness. Even if it leads you through great discomfort, if only you could have enlightenment and you could see your need and it brings you to the Savior. And it brings you to, the knee, to your knees and you say to yourself, oh, I desire him. I want to stand under that blood. I want the protection of what he's done. I want his love and his atoning death on Calvary to purchase me and to take away my sin. Oh, if enlightenment could visit you and bring you to long for Christ and to bow the knee to him and to see who he is and what he's done and how he can save you. That's what we need, dear friends, to turn from the delusion of this world. Here it is. They have healed also the hurt, the injury of the daughter of my people slightly, 
saying, peace, peace, safety, safety, success, satisfaction without God. When there is no peace, the Babylonians will come. You will be plunged over the precipice at the end of life. You will have to stand before God and give an account to him and be judged by him when all the time there is a savior who was ready to suffer and die for repentant sinners how much we need him come to him friends value him desire him trust in him depend on him let's pray oh god our gracious heavenly father help us give us realism Deliver us from our foolishness. O oh Lord, help us to feel our need. Visit us, we pray, and deal with our hearts, with our souls, even now, and bring needy souls to repentance and faith and trust in Christ alone. We ask it in his name, for his sake. Amen.